so for people uh, watching this session and uh, it is being recorded okay so uh, one minute left Seems uh, the time is up and uh, we shall start. So uh, today talk is uh, dedicated to Apache PLC 4X and unified uh, field pass API, which can be achieved with it. So uh, today's agenda is composed from two things, which are main, the field passes and uh, the OC. Those are, I believe, mo most important, but uh, we also have a part which is uh, closer to the uh, PLC 4X and introduction, how it works and uh, how you can utilize it. There is also a um, short intro to can open, which is one of the field passes, one of the oldest ones, but uh, still uh, in use, I would say. And uh, uh, it might be basic compared to the others, but uh, it gives us everything we need to experience uh, uh, with the PLC 4X API. So, uh, my name is uh, Wukash and, uh, uh, well, a short note at the beginning is that this presentation is mainly for IT audience. So if you work with uh, industrial automation, I bet you know more than I, and you can pretty much uh, catch me on, on a basic mistake. So please, if you spot any of my mistakes, don't hesitate to contact me or simply to comment for other viewers uh, in the future in YouTube or other video channels. Uh, where I made mistakes. This is not, not a problem. So, uh, again, who I am? I'm Wukash and, uh, well, I was Britter two years ago, uh, obviously, uh, but I'm Polish, so uh, been working in IT since quite a bit. I believe now it's uh, over 15 years uh, of, of my professional career, whatever the, the term would be. Uh, but most of my time I spent so far with open source and uh, I work with other projects in Apache uh, Software Foundation and uh, plc 4 x is one of those, I would say, most recent one where I got my hands on. Uh, Career-wise, I'm self-employed. I uh, do work for a company I founded called Connector.io. <laughs> uh, and uh, I authored several add-ons uh, for another open source project called OpenHub. And OpenHub is um, home automation pass per se, uh, but it integrates very well also with industrial uh, standards. So uh, let's start on field buses and what the term really is, because uh, we see uh, different terms and uh, th their meaning is uh, Dep depends really on who makes the, the definition. So I will try to make it very basic. The field bus system is an industrial computer network. Normally in the past, it wouldn't be so much computer-ish, but nowadays it, the, the reality is that those are more and more computerized systems and uh, have more and more in common with the computer systems. Uh, but what is very specific about these networks is that they are uh, very close to the real-time processing of the uh, data. And by real-time, I really mean the hard real-time, not the real-time in the software perspective that we have access to the data within uh, several seconds. Here, for the field passes, the most important thing is the uh, real-time approach uh, or the characteristics, which means that the uh, cycle times and communication, everything have to be predictable and uh, have to work in the uh, constant time manner. And uh, this allows the field passes to control the equipment, such uh, motion uh, engines and the other things, which we don't really want to have the, uh, some random jitter happening from the network uh, switch. So uh, this means that uh, uh, also these field passes are built for a specific purpose. And depending on the purpose, they can be used uh, for long distance communication, or medium distances but with higher data rates or very short range but with extremely high data exchanges so uh, this also means that uh, the modified versions of some field passes might work for uh, kilometers long 
communications while for example the internet is limited to 100 meters so uh, that's why the field buses uh, my work and my exist coexist with the internet and the industrial internet as well because the uh, they have also other advantages so from the history perspective we can start from uh, modbus even if it's not the first one uh, first thing which could be called a field bus it is a very first popular one it was published in 1979 by a company called modicon and uh, modicon said we make plcs and the plcs are uh, programmable logic controllers so this term didn't change since then and they said, OK, this is the way how we will communicate our controller with the peripheries and how we will exchange the data. And because back then, in late 70s, there was no standard for such thing, Modbus became very, very popular. And uh, this popularity, uh, I believe, overtook the uh, idea, which was quite basic. And uh, so in the mid 80s, there were some standardization uh, attempts which led to the formation of different systems. And one of those is, for example, Canvas, which uh, was initially aimed for automotive industry as the low cost uh, cabling and uh, communication medium. But in practice, it turned out to be also useful for automation scenarios. And so in 2000, uh, sorry, in 90s, in early 90s, there was a can open standard uh, published. Uh, but uh, on the other hand side, earlier, before even Canvas uh, and can open was uh, standardized, there was a work started on Profibus. It was also in the late 80s, uh, but it was published only in 1993. So as you can see, some of these things like Modbus are already 50 years old. And uh, those are still being used, uh, or I mean, maybe not 50 years old, but uh, th those are very old. Even if you will have a look on the uh, Profibus and Profinet, those are already 17, 17 years old. But what is different between Profibus, Ethernet, PowerLink, Profinet, and Ethercat? Well, in practice, those are uh, different field passes, and the last three of them are built on top of the uh, Ethernet. And, uh, so-called industrial version of the uh, internet and there are many many more uh, standards and uh, uh, field passes which uh, wouldn't fit into this slide so the main differences for field passes is really the uh, physical medium so what cable cabling is necessary for it to work uh, will this cabling provide the power and the power the, the nodes I know this is quite a, a strange, but there are some uh, situations where the cabling is limited just to two, three, or four lines, and then it's uh, very important to deliver the power over the same cabling which is used for the communication. The other aspect is, for example, network size, meaning how big is the address pool? How many nodes can work at the same time in the network? And uh, this really determines how big the, which system we actually should use. If we need uh, a network, for example, which is composed from more than uh, 130 nodes, part of these field passes will be gone because they are not having, they, they don't have enough of addressing space to accommodate so many nodes. And uh, then uh, there are also safety features like cabling redundancy, the communication speeds, and uh, formal uh, things like openness of the protocol and the actual protocol itself. And those two things at the end are very much related to the legal stuff which needs to be completed in order to get in use or get the documents uh, necessary to implement the protocol. So some standards like CanOpen are published for a very long time and you can acquire the documentation fairly easy, but some other require you to sign in or buy the standard. So uh, this means that there are different entrance criteria for different of these standards. But the key differences which we can outline here is really the topology. So is this a bus system where all the nodes are connected to a single cable? Is it a star? And the star topology could be seen as a, as a normal local area network where we have a central switch and then this switch is used uh, to communicate between all the participants. Or in the end, the ring topology, which allows to uh, communicate 
or over the cycle. And uh, the, each and every of these topologies has certain advantages and disadvantages. So we will not talk about those, but uh, the field buses are uh, really specified in multiple uh, axes. And uh, one of those is the topology. The other one is communication method or communication style. In the industrial automation, we still use terms like master slave, which determine how the communication between uh, nodes is being made. Do we have uh, equal rights between the nodes? And then we have a peer-to-peer -peer communication uh, and peer-to-peer uh, -peer cabling, for example. Or we have more centralized approach where we have a master and a slave. And the master is responsible for dispatching the orders and slave is required to answer according to the protocol. And the, the last point could be a family of the protocol which is not real, uh, not not a real family, but rather the terminology which is used by these standards. So some of them might be uh, closer in the terms of the terminology to can open, profibus or SIP. The SIP is common industrial uh, protocol, I would say, uh, if I remember correctly, and SIP is very popular, for example, in the Northern America. So depending on which country you are coming on or which continent some things might be more or less popular and so this really also divides the uh, market the other aspect of the field buses is really how fast we can communicate and how fast we can uh, acquire answers from the nodes and uh, because of the scenarios uh, such the motion control this is uh, very important from the precision perspective so how precise our machine can be and how fast it can react to the changes of the controller or dispatched by the controller. So Ethernet IP, for example, is limited to one millisecond. And uh, this is uh, maximum uh, or th th this is the lowest response time we can get. We can get always higher, but uh, uh, obviously for the Ethernet IP, this is the base. And the jitter is really the lag which we can get. And as you can see, uh, for example, with the power link, we have a response time below one millisecond. With the Profinet, it, it is the same. But for Profinet, there are also the other ways uh, or other variants of the standards which allows you to require to acquire even lower answer times or uh, synchronization times in other terms. Uh, or in the end, we have the EtherCAD, which is um, uh, which is able to make a very low uh, response times and very fast data exchanges. So as you can see, this also impacts the uh, use of those. And now, since we got really into the uh, differences, we need also to outline um, several important aspects which are coming from the open systems in interconnection model, the so-called OSI. And uh, the OSI is the way how we draw lines between the communication layers. And these communication layers are not really bound to any specific protocol. Those are rather the uh, abstract uh, levels in which communication could or should happen. So not all of them are usually required. Some of them might be omitted by, by specific technology, for example, CAM. Uh, Canvas specifies only layer one and one and two. It doesn't specify anything above. And uh, in a moment, we will see what it really means and what, it, what is the impact for us as uh, programmers and developers. And uh, so even if uh, the OSI is not very popular in the IT in the, nowadays, it is referred in many, many places through layer N. For example, if we work in the IT, quite often we hear, load balancer uh, or layer seven load balancer, which means that this load balancer works at application layer. And here, this is the drawing which shows us uh, how the, uh, the specific things are uh, being used or, or how the layers are constructed. So at the lowest level, we have a physical layer and this physical layer is more or less the cabling. So what is the uh, requirement for the physical installation? Then the data link tells us how the data is coded on this cabling. And above that, we construct the network. And the network then allows to uh, build the transports uh, between the nodes. And uh, above three layers are defined by the OSI. 
but they, those are not very often used. I mean, they, they, in practice, everything is sit, uh, sitting on top of the transport and uh, then the application layer is being implemented. But there are several examples where the presentation and session layer is, is being used. So for us, as the IT in the IT scope, on the application layer, we have, uh, for example, DNS, uh, NTP, HTTP. So those are the ways how we uh, communicate between the IT systems, more, more or less. Then we have TCP and UDP, which determines the way how we communicate. Is it the uh, connectionless uh, data exchange or, or connection oriented? And uh, also the IP and MAC and the ITER uh, level, those are not very often referred. I mean, we do kind of use the IP addresses, but not very often. And uh, this is because everything in terms of the IT landscape is standardized by the operating system. So we have the user space, we have a network stack, and then there is network stack in the operating system dictates how the drivers should be made and how the uh, hardware in, uh, or how the hardware interfaces are being pulled into the system. In, uh, in practice, uh, for the field passes, they work on uh, more or less all the layers, usually on layer one, two, and seven, but some of them can also work on the transport layer. So uh, from the perspective of the field pass, uh, they, are, uh, they, they might be built on top of the uh, internet or so-called industrial internet. And this means that in practice, we could try to connect this industrial internet directly into our computers. In, in most of the cases, it will work and it will allow us to acquire data through the network analysis tools such as Wireshark, TCP dump, or others which are specific to the other systems. And uh, uh, this means also that we can interact with the equipment in some ways in non-time critical uh, fashion, meaning that we cannot uh, control or it could be difficult to write the controlling application, but we will be able to acquire the data or uh, analyze the data which is being exchanged. And uh, even if field buses are uh, separate standards, they will usually uh, refer the OSI layers in multiple ways. And uh, before we will go into more details, uh, there is one thing which we need to denote. The field passes in most of the cases will bring some notion of the device descriptor. And this device descriptor is sometimes described with the standard, sometimes it's uh, additional documentation, but this descriptor is published usually by the manufacturer of the specific device, which, which is compliant with the standard. And this descriptor is later on used by the engineer uh, over here to create the configuration. So when he pulls in the specific motion controller or uh, a, a, an engine or, or the uh, motor, uh, it can, uh, the, the engineer can configure it and then this configuration is uh, created as a, as a document which can be deployed uh, by the integrator in the field. So this is a very common uh, way how uh, different field passes are being organized. Those are made uh, in a way that the device can be parameterized because uh, we are living in the times where the devices are very complex and uh, uh, the more complex devices have uh, for quite a lot of the configuration options. And so there, there is usually a way how this configuration should be exchanged. And now if we will look on the CanOpen, which was referred in the beginning of the uh, this presentation, for can open, we have a term called object dictionary. So the object dictionary is more or less the address list of the device, which can be used to retrieve the information about the specific parameters and uh, uh, behaviors of the device. Then the engineer can create the device configuration. And so the manufacturer publishes thing called EDS, and this EDS is electronic data sheet. The electronic data sheet lists all the device capabilities. And then engineer does the parameterization of the specific device of the given kind. And in the end, we uh, we get the DC, DCF, which is device configuration file. And this device configuration file can be shipped to the site where a further customization can be made by the, by the integrator. So 
as you can see, there is some uh, work and standardization around that, but this does not impact in many, many ways the standard itself. This tells us, uh, programmers and engineers and other people, how we could communicate with the specific equipment to get the data. And uh, if, we, if we would have a look on two uh, to, to, to field passes which are referred in the title of this presentation or description of this presentation, can open and profinet, we will see that the OSI layers used by these field passes are different. For example, uh, for can open, the lower two layers, the data link and physical, are specified by Canvas. And can open that defines only the application layer. And later on, these profiles uh, are add addendums to the standard which uh, can be used to uh, certify the device. But the base is the Canine Automation 301, which is the uh, uh, number of this norm. For the Profinet, on the other hand side, on the lowest level, the lowest two layers are uh, based on the Ethernet and MAC. Uh, so this is uh, pretty much the same as for the computer networks. But on the top of it, we have the Profinet Realtime, which defines the network and the transport strategies. But in some ways, it might be used, in, it might not be used, because uh, here for the Profinet, there are multiple variants and sub-protocols which could be used. So the top layer of the Profinet uh, can be composed from several things, like there is a DCP, Profinet Device Configuration uh, or Discovery Configuration uh, Protocol. There is also IRT and other variants of the Profinet or, or the uh, sub-specifications which are dedicated to different uh, scenarios. In the top, we again have profiles and uh, the most common uh, kinds of the devices which should be used. Uh, and uh, here we can also compare the same physical layer and the same protocol which is uh, Modbus. Uh, so Modbus can be used in the TCP version, which works over the computer networks, all RTU. The RTU is the uh, serial-based protocol, but in practice, the protocol is the same. So the protocol data unit, the functions of the protocol are pretty much the same. The difference is how they are being encoded. So here you can see that for the Modbus TCP, we rely on the computer networking, but for the Modbus RTU, we rely on the serial protocol and uh, and the uh, rs485 cabling on the uh, right hand side you can see profibus which interestingly uses the same physical layer which is rs485 but it uses different data link layer so even if the cabling is compatible the data link and the, the, the data frames the the communication frames are completely different and so the top layer is also different and uh, the, the thing which I did refer before is that the Modbus did not have any standardization. And here you can see that on the top of the Modbus, there is no way to describe the devices. So each manufacturer publishes its own the documentation and there is really no way you can automate the processing of it. So as you can see here, the different uh, standards uh, can use the same uh, physical layer, meaning that in some ways they are compatible. So we could in theory reuse cabling between those, but beside that, we cannot reuse anything. Uh, and uh, now two, two slides about the statistics and how it looks alike now. Uh, so how it looked in the past and how the uh, current field pass market looks alike. And these uh, are the materials published by a company called HMS. And uh, I took it from their website and there are links under the pictures which uh, which you can uh, use to, to go and visit. So this is the evolution of the field pass market uh, from the 2014 to 2018. So now it looks even even different, even more different. And you can see that the traditional field passes are in the descent since since quite a bit. And the industrial Ethernet is on the on the rising for quite a quite a long time. And uh, this means that, uh, or the, the proper reading of this graph is following. The amount of the installations is uh, being made is growing more on the uh, industrial internet side of things, and it is not growing that rapid for the field passes. And so this is the relative comparison of the 
uh, of the shares and not of the growth. And here in this graph, you can see uh, what is the different, what is the market partitioning on the current year. Oh, this is some estimation made by the HMS networks, and you can see that actual year the industrial internet is already 65%. And uh, it is growing at the 8% year to year and the field bus market already started to shrink, meaning that the new installations are not being made with it. And here you can see uh, who are the dominant. So you can see Profinet, Ethernet, IP, Ethercad and uh, other, other, other communication methods. So here this, uh, this ring tells us uh, what are the key players. And now we will have a look of what is being supported by the Apache PLC Forex? So uh, we have already some work begun on the Profinet, which is responsible for 18% of the global market. We do have actually support for Ethernet IP, which is there since uh, quite quite long time, but it requires some more work to, 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 to get uh, production trade deployments. Uh, so those two gives us a, a fair fairly big chunk of the market access. And we also have the support for Modbus, TCP, and RTU. So this is another 10% of the market. And the Canopen uh, is, is just a little bit 2%. So if we sum all these numbers together, we will realize that the Apache plc 4 x gives you a possibility to talk with up to 47% of the machinery out there. This is quite a bit. So. Uh, now, jumping on the PLC Forex itself. So this is a Swiss army knife for industrial integrations. And uh, this uh, in practice means it brings you one API for multiple protocols and standards. And the uh, mo most important aspect, I would say, those are independent of transport and uh, there is some portability across the languages. Uh, so we have the Java version of the drivers uh, we have version written in Go, C, C Sharp, and Python. So they, they are not equally supported, but if you are interested into it, uh, in it, you can actually get uh, your language supported if necessary. Uh, so another important aspect is that the way how the drivers are being made with Apache PLC 4X is that we do support both ends of the communication. So it's not only client, but the structures which we do generate allows you to implement the server. And uh, this is also a very remark remarkable point because we actually have a simulator of the uh, PLC, uh, Siemens S7 PLC, which does not have anything in common with the uh, PLC, but it does simulate the network communication which is being made by this kind of the PLCs. So in theory, you can write your own emulator of the PLC with, uh, with our tools toolkit. So what, what PLC brings to you? Uh, so this one API to rule, uh, rule them all allows you to read, write, and subscribe. And these are pretty much the different communication styles happening in the practice. So we can have read, write access. We can also have a subscribe operations, which means that we are notified or we are meaning that your program actually is being notified about the state changes of the machinery out there. There are also several more things uh, which are not covered by an, any standards such as the access to the metadata about the device, if it's possible to be fetched at the ring, or, or real time. There is also a browse and discovery functionality. So the remaining two, browse and discovery, are in the uh, basic form. The, those are not implemented across all drivers we have because in some of them, it's impossible to get such functionality. So uh, going further, the uh, you can really help the PLC 4X if you will test it with your equipment, if you will work with docs or together with us and help us with the tooling and conformance. Uh, so we will get it covered. And uh, uh, if you will use it in your IT projects, then it will definitely help us to, to acquire more, more usage. And I believe uh, there are several more things which are relevant from the developer's perspective. And uh, here uh, you can see where is your application. So this is what uh, really 
have to happen uh, on your end. And this is the whole thing which is being supported by the PLC for x so, so here you can uh, utilize the APIs to talk to the uh, Apache PLC for x API. And uh, all the magic happening over left-hand side is there to communicate with the different equipment. And all you need to do is to uh, write driver-specific field syntax. And uh, so on this field syntax, my, uh, I can jump over here. These are the examples of the field names or field references which can be used. And those are different between the different drivers. So here, this is, for example, uh, reading the byte, single byte from the address of 200 on the PLC. This is, for example, uh, the address format for can open. And this is another one for uh, some, some other communication. So uh, what is relevant here in, the, in this part is that currently we have one-to-one -one mapping between the field and the result. So meaning that the, you can construct a request with multiple fields and each field will bring you uh, one result item. So uh, a short example in a moment. So uh, here also coming back for a moment to where we get the field uh, identifiers and the addresses. So these are coming from the deployment configuration or from the object dictionary for a specific device. So uh, really we need to know which kind of the device is being communicated and only then put into the, exam into the code. And uh, here you can see this is the address string, which uh, tells us that we want to read the uh, specific can open object. And uh, this is the connection string. So the connection string, those are two things which are very specific to the device you want to communicate with. And uh, that's pretty much it. The remaining part of the code is the same across different, uh, different equipments. Uh, and uh, several general notes. Uh, the plc 4 x API is made on top of Java 8 completable uh, feature, so it promotes asynchronous uh, communication style in most of the places. And uh, going further, if we will look on the can open, uh, there are several different um, or the the other spacing which I did refer before is limited to 127 nodes, so we cannot have more than that. But uh, what is very important is that they can open specified services, and these services are being then made in the field references on our end. Uh, the can open also specifies the data types which can be exchanged or the encoding of the specific fields uh, and data, which uh, can be referred later on in the field syntax. So we have access to the booleans integers, reals, so the, the floating, floating, floating point numbers, the byte arrays, the time, uh, time references, and also strings. And uh, these uh, data and the encodings then are being pulled in can open profiles. Even if those are not supported by the uh, PLC4X, these profiles can be used, for example, to generate the client program. And uh, uh, so the general, general syntax for the can open in PLC4X is uh, we specify the service, the node, and the pro protocol specific or the service specific part. And uh, uh, this is example of how we could write the data. So again, uh, you can see we have the address, and this address tells that the node 13 address uh, uh, 2000 should be a visible string, and this is the value which should be written over there. And uh, we have also a support for subscriptions, meaning that if the other nodes publish the data, we can acquire this data as well. So the field syntax there is a little bit different. So this is the uh, transmit PDO, which is the broadcast message ID. This is the uh, node ID and this is encoding of the data. Record really means let give, give me access to the byte payload of the uh, of the message. And uh, the receiving part of our program is done in the uh, event handler, which is being notified each time when we receive the data. So this is the basic subscribe handler, which allows us to grab the data. So I will Mm, skip the showcase, uh, and uh, I believe I almost overreached the time. But uh, one additional slide about the differences between CanOpen and Profinet. So the CanOpen payloads are 
minimalistic, like eight bytes of the data. For the profinet, the payloads are much bigger. Uh, obviously, we still need to uh, count the overhead of the frame itself, but as you can see, it's hundred times of hundred times more. The topology is between uh, those is also different, and the descriptor format is again different. Uh, so the complexity of the Profinet is much, much higher since it's a uh, younger standard and uh, it uses the computer networking, then it's, it can do much more uh, compared to the uh, Canopen, which is fairly low in the complexity. And uh, both support synchronous and asynchronous communication. But the key take point is that both can be handled with the Apache PLC for X APIs. So, uh, the last slide is really the contact to, to me, uh, but I believe we should switch to the uh, Q&A session. So, are there any questions? Mm. I am not sure if, if I can control this. Uh, but if if you have any questions, then please uh, write it also on on, on the chat. Uh, yes, Chris. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so I just thought yeah, you you were uh, doing it fine. Uh, so um, if you have any questions, there's the Q and A tab. You can ask mm -hmm. a question or just write it in the chat. So we we've still got a few minutes. I think ten till. Uh, I have to leave. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I have a showcase which uh, can prove that the whole thing works. Uh, and uh, then uh, we, we can really uh, see how different programs can work with the can open. Toddy wants a demo. Okay, then let me, uh, let me show it. Uh, you should be able to see my screen. Uh, so here, this is the uh, very basic uh, dump uh, of, of the traffic happening on the on the canvas. So here on the Linux, you have uh, a software stack called SocketCan, which allows you to tap into the uh, CAN interface, but it also allows you to uh, emulate one. So the CAN dump tool is there to dump the traffic happening on the bus. And here you can see that there is an interface name, the node ID, and then the payload. And here I have running a basic simulation program written in the Python. And this is the example program which can read the name of the other node. So here I will just run it. Um, and uh, here you can see that the node name uh, two is can open rocks. So the node ID is uh, coming from the address. And uh, if we will go to the bus, you can see quite a bit of traffic generated by this little exchange. But this is because CanOpen has very tight limit of the eight bytes per message segment. With the uh, computer networks, it would be much less. And here I can also show you the uh, other, other program other simulator, which is raw, uh, written in the Node.js. And uh, we will be communicating over this virtual interface to receive the, uh, su to subscribe for the uh, data sent by the other program. And uh, so this subscribe is launched. And here you can see that we receive the data. And the data doesn't really change. Uh, actually, there is some change in the end, but uh, these are the periodic messages sent by the other node. And this node is obviously the software based. Here you can see that this traffic is happening every second or so. But in practice, it could be a real hardware behind these messages and uh, you get access to the equipment which communicates according to the standard. So this is the proof that it works. And uh, in practice, it gives you uh, access to motion control scenarios and other things which are uh, used in, in different scenarios. Because CAN, as, as is, is uh, used in various places and CAN open is not only limited to motion control, but also to the uh, some building automation. So 
Um, uh, yeah, and, and one thing that I, I might want to add, uh, when you said, uh, did you say a Profinet sort of 1,500 uh, bytes or something like that? Well, uh, to be to, to be honest, that's sort of the the connection part. So you tr you connect, and the the data transfer is a lot more efficient. So it's not mm -hmm. it's not that. Yes, yes, and uh, the main limit of can uh, can open in the two zero uh, two zero eight version we, from 1994 is the size of the message. I mean, we cannot squeeze a lot of data in eight bytes. So, <laughs> uh, honestly, this is a, a single digit. If you have a, a complex uh, processing, then it's uh, it's far too. Uh, less too efficient, but there are some other versions of the can can open standard uh, which are less popular, but they have bigger payload sizes. So in theory, it's possible, but the lowest common ground, similarly like for Modbus, is this can open uh, from 1994, which does quite basic work, but it does it in a very simple way. So uh, this means that uh, probably in the future, the can will have some difficult times surviving, but there, there are also some works to allow passing much higher payloads over the CAN bus infrastructure as well. It requires different microchips, but in in, uh, in practice, it's possible to have uh, much higher data rates and much bigger payloads, but it, it requires simply the, a new hardware. Okay. Uh, I do have uh, some question and answers, uh, but I think there, those are not uh, towards this particular session. Uh, so there is one question. Uh, I think if you're seeing that, uh, you probably clicked on uh, event. Uh, <sighs> and and they're uh, sort of, so you got to select the session tab. Very yeah, it's sort point. of confusing at first, yeah. Yes, very good point. So we have no Q&A or no questions for this uh, session, but uh, uh, looking at the chat window here, OPC UA, MQTT, Spark plug. So the the thing is that we do have a support for OPC UA, and uh, it is brand new uh, and it works uh, quite 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 fine. Uh, our other team member uh, Ben Hudson uh, implemented it uh, prior zero nine release. So if you are interested in it, then you can uh, you can test it with the Ethernet IP. I did say that it requires some more work because the uh, person who implemented it uh, is less active in the project. So if you have Ethernet IP uh, equipment, then you are welcome to uh, start playing with it. Uh, but regarding the MQTT, we do not have any specific work around the MQTT because this is more a transport layer. It does The MQTT itself does not form a protocol only the spark plug b does but then it's more about the processing payloads and structures which are being sent over the uh, specific topics and the specific uh, naming convention on the mqtt so there is not much work we can do with the spark plug but you could in theory use plc 4 x apis to process the payloads uh, which are being sent over the uh, MQTT. For example, if you have the uh, payload which is binary coded according to some schema, then you can describe this schema using uh, MSpec uh, and generate the code which will parse it uh, both in Java, for example, and see where you will be writing this data. So in practice, uh, the MQTT is, is a different set of shoes, I, I would say, but uh, it's not that far away. You can, for example, use the Apache PLC Forex to source the data and then send it over the MQTT to your central broker. So, um, yeah, so uh, I guess I, I'll be dropping out in two minutes at, at latest because uh, uh, I, I got to prepare for my talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's uh, directly uh, after this one. Um, and if, if you're interested in uh, the, the how we Produce the drivers. Uh, yeah, I strongly recommend you join the next session because uh, that's where I'll be sharing how we actually manage to bring uh, all of the drivers that we have to all sorts of different languages. Yes. Okay.
So uh, thanks a lot for that great talk. Um, uh, did a real good job. Um, and yeah, well, looking forward. Uh, maybe uh, maybe today we'll, there will be more people uh, willing to join the, the BOF session after the next talk. Um, so um, please give it a try. Uh, if it's empty, uh, well, you can sort of probably grab me in the whiskey boff. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so thanks again and uh, see you soon. See you soon. So uh, one, one additional note uh, on the protocols. I did mention uh, the Ethernet IP and uh, also between the slides or beside the slides OPC UA. We do have also in Apache PLC correct support for Siemens S7 and back of ADS communication. So those are based on the TCP IP and uh, those are not standards and field, field passes. These are vendor specific ways how to communicate with particular equipment. But uh, there are other ways which you can communicate with the field pass, for example, over the PLC, which is already deployed. The reality is, however, that most of the PLCs deployed out there are programmed by the manufacturer of the machinery. And you never have access, or in most of the cases, you have no access to the sources of the PLC pro project. So you cannot really guess what the addresses are uh, because the encoding is binary and so on and so on and so on. So the only one way how you can actually get reliable access to the data is going over the field bus. And then if you have the communication happening over the Profinet can open and so on, your program from the IT perspective can tap into this communication and make sense out of it. Because out of the uh, PLC, it is a bit of work to figure out which registers, which addresses on the PLC side are meaning what. And uh, it's not very uh, reliable process and re reproducible. So uh, the safest ground is really going over the field pass, which gives you access to the data unprocessed. And this means that the PLC uh, program, which is running, it can average the data, it can do uh, other things uh, with, with it or publish just a fraction of it. Uh, while the message exchanges happening all over the cable between the controller and the IOs is continuous. It happens all the time. It's just, uh, for example, updated cycling in the, in the cycles of the PLC as the author wish it. And uh, so this means that uh, getting beside the PLC or, or on the side of the PLC, you can get this uh, information. And uh, uh, yeah, Chris will probably tell you also a little bit more about the uh, passive drivers, which uh, will be described in the uh, between the slides probably in the next session. So I will be uh, finishing this session. So thank you, everything. Thank you uh, for joining me and uh, for listening to this session. I hope you will. Uh, have good time with Apache PLC 4X and I'm looking forward to see some of you uh, in our mailing list. Thank you very much.